So the first thing I wanted to ask you about, um, could you talk a bit about why staying in the present is so important? Mm. So staying in the present. Well, you can miss what's going on if you're not staying in the present, right? If you're uh, planning what you're going to say next, say even in just in a conversation, if, if uh, I'm planning what I'm going to say next as you're talking, I'm not going to really hear what you're saying. And there might be something in what you're saying that I don't know about that's subtle. And so if I'm not really listening, I'm not going to be able to pick it up. And so, you know, we lose the opportunity to be informed of things in our lives that we're not aware of and that we may need to know if we're not in the present. So that's one. Now, if you're... um you, you know, just in, in your day-to-day -day life, you see people walking across the road, looking at their phones, or, I mean, people daydream when they're driving, they get in car accidents, like, you know, just being in present, not, not having a car accident. I got rear-ended. Oh, let's see, Jordan was driving and his parents were in the car and the, the, uh, it was dark. So it, it was past dusk. So it was dark out and the cars in front had stopped on the highway because there was going to be another highway we were turning onto and Jordan stopped, but the person behind us did not stop, not at all. And rammed right into us. What was she doing? Was she present? No, she wasn't present. She was doing something. I don't know what she was doing. Listening to music, looking at herself in the mirror. Like, I don't know what she was doing. Was she on her phone? I don't know. But when you're not present, you lose the opportunity to, respond in a timely manner to whatever is happening and what you want to do is you want to be in a position to do the next right thing and that's all there is is the next right thing and we get our cues from our environment and so you're looking to see what it is in your environment that you can act on that is the next right thing to do and if you're not present you won't see it and so then you're not going to be going towards what is best one step at a time and that's that's the way that's the way it seems to work best um why does life become more adventurous when you do god's will well because you don't know where you're going <laughs> so it's a, a little bit like you have blinders on because you're not the one who's deciding where you're going to go you're um you're taking your cues from um, from your conscience so you're taking your cues from your conscience and that's also in the moment i mean you can plan for your future you can have uh, a dream that you have that is set up for three to five years down the road something that you're aiming at but that doesn't mean that you don't live in the moment and in the present right so i'm not saying that you only live in the present that's that's not exactly right because we have to have vision we have to have vision because we have to have a dream um to look forward to we have to have something like that to look forward to so you have to have uh conjured up your deepest desires and and have them laid down in a specific manner as possible so that you can go towards them i mean you might veer off in one direction or another but you want to go you have to ask me that question again because i yeah well, um why does life become more adventurous when you do god's will mm. You know, you find that things work out in a way that you had never planned when you do God's will. And uh, it's it's remarkable to see that things could end up better than you planned. And uh, that's God's will is, you know, you don't think you, you, you worry about how things might go, say, between you and your mother or something. You worry about how things could go. But if you leave it up to God and um, you don't take control of the situation because lots of people think if they take control then then they can work it out and that things will go in a way that's best but if you actually just pay attention and are present and respond to what's there then things go in a manner that is more of a dance between you and the other person right so it's more of a dance and that uh rhythm that's god's will that rhythm of life that's in a that's playful and and dance like that's 
that's what where you want to be. Um, why is it important to pray about gratitude? Well, I'll give you, a, I'll tell you a little story. So I was visiting my sister last weekend. We had about five days off from the tour and my sister isn't well at all. So we flew to Vancouver Island to visit her. She's in a nursing home and she's probably in her last months of life. Right. And how many years ago, 2018, she went on tour with us. She was, I knew she had dementia. So I knew she was starting to show signs of cognitive decline and she'd been she'd had neurological testing so and my mother had the same thing and so we pretty much knew what she was suffering from and she came on tour and I asked her what she was going to eat when she was on tour and she said she'd eat a carnivore diet like I eat and so for two weeks she did she pretty good she stayed on uh the diet with us and then we went to my son's wedding and my sister-in-law told me just not just recently I didn't know this that she noticed that my sister was in better shape than she'd been in a very long time. And I thought so too. Like she kept up to, she kept up to, up to us and we change cities every day. It's, it's a very, it's pretty fast paced life that we have. And she, she kept up pretty well. So I was impressed with her uh, agil agility and her, her ability to do this. But now of course she's in a nursing home. She can't even sit straight anymore because her uh, her brain isn't working well anymore and she's still there if you can catch her eyes her eyes are very intense so she she's there but she's not able to express herself she can't speak and she can't stand up and she can't sit up and she can use her arms but her legs are, are pretty much not in her uh not under her control anymore and and it's sad you know and when i left there i was sad and i was thinking should i have kept on what should I have kept on about this diet with her because I don't live with her she lived with her partner and then she lived with my sister should I be you know sh should I've been more insistent I would have had to have a fight with her daughters to make this change happen because people who are getting dementia they eat they eat a lot of sugar and they can't help themselves by that time. So they just, if you put a little bit, of, if something in front of them that has sugar in it, they're going to eat it. In fact, my mom, she used to hold food in her cheeks when she was very ill. But if you give her a cinnamon bun, she could eat it with no problem at all. So they they eat sugar. And so if you were going to give someone like that a carnivore diet, you'd have to be with them all the time and taking care of them. And if I was going to impose that on her children or my sister or her partner, I would have had to have a big fight. Plus, I didn't have a lot of evidence yet. I only had this case study with my sister. So I didn't have a lot of evidence that this was true. Now, can I forgive myself? Can I forgive my family? Well, we didn't have all the information we needed. So how can I judge harshly? So I, I can't hold myself to judgment really, I can't hold myself to any judgment. I have to forgive myself for not being as informed as I wished I would have been to save her. And gratitude, I can be grateful that she came along on this tour. She showed me that she could do it and that when she went on this diet, that she was better. And so I can share that with people. So I can be grateful for what she that she put herself forward to do the next right thing. Because, you know, when I called her to go on tour, she thought no. And then she thought, you know, if I don't go, Tammy won't ask me again. And so I'm going to go. I'm going to do the next right thing. Even though she might have barely been able to take that plane from Vancouver Island to New York by herself. You know, I, she did it. I don't know how difficult it was for her because because she was having trouble. But she did it. She did the next right thing. I saw that it was good for her. Now there's way more evidence that it's true that, that a carnivore diet helps. And I can tell this story. So I'm grateful to her for doing the next right thing and being brave and coming out there and spending that time with me. And it's it's hard to find gratitude. You have to decide that's what you want. If you want your life to go by without, ha without holding a grudge. And holding a grudge, you know, anger, uh, resentment, that, that's, a, that's a disaster. Resentment never takes you anywhere but into um, 
anger and conflict. So it's not a good plan. Um, why is Mother Mary important to you? That's a good question. You know, um, I think Mother Mary was important to me from the time I was a young girl. I went to the Protestant church and I didn't feel that Mother Mary was a prominent figure in the teachings in the Protestant church. And I missed that that was the fact. And so now that I'm getting ready to go into the Catholic church and I'm praying the rosary every day and uh, Mother Mary is a prominent figure in the Catholic faith, uh, it seems right to me. Um, this was my great grandmother's faith. She was Catholic. So um, it's not surprising that maybe I had some Catholicism in my blood, as it were. And so I think that's partly why she's important to me. But the other thing is, you know, before I was looking at this in a religious manner, when my daughter was young, she was very ill. And my mom passed away in 2007. My daughter would have been um, 15. And when she was 17, she had a couple of major surgeries because she was so ill. And I used to pray to my mother all the time. And I, I I have weekly meetings with my priest, and I said, you know, I used to pray to my mother every night uh, that she would intervene and help me with my daughter. And he said, yeah, that he said, I've seen, I've heard of that lots of times that people do that. And, and I would say that praying to my mother was really, I was praying to Mother Mary. I was praying to what's best in mothers. You know, I was praying to the highest of of what is what was in my mother and in every mother, and that's Mother Mary. Um, this is a bit of a weird question, but I'm curious what you think as to why suffering exists at all. Well, you know, I suffered when I was in the hospital. I was very sick, and um, I can be grateful for that time. I mean, I know I did survive, and so... Um, that gives me a, a certain outcome that was favorable. But even though I didn't know if I was going to survive, when I, when I didn't know I was going to survive, it was, it, was, um, it was comforting. It was comforting for me. You have to ask me the question again. Um, why do you think suffering exists? Oh yeah. Why did suffering? Well, I think we have to learn, <laughs> we have to learn the challenges that God provides for us. And uh, we learn those challenges usually with some suffering because to give up what we thought was true and then to find out that it, we were, that what we knew was inadequate, uh, you're going to suffer when you give up your preconceived ideas. So even that, and sometimes your preconceived ideas can can take you from, you know, a, a marriage and a family and a job, finding out that you aren't who you think you were or your wife isn't who she you thought she was. And now you're without your job and you're without your family and you're without your spouse. And but those kind of those kind of sufferings. Sometimes, you know, we, because we're not living in the present and we are, we're thinking about how we would like life to be. So we kind of have a, uh, we've, we've twisted reality some. <clears throat> so we are living in a, in a dream in a way that we think is good. Then when we find out what's true, um, there's suffering involved in finding what it is that we've been avoiding, uh, if we've been denying ourselves the knowledge that we need to be true to ourselves. I mean, reality is a harsh place. It's no wonder people hide from what's true. It's no wonder they do. But but you can't hide because uh, because suffering will come. Suffering will come. Suffering's going to come anyways. We all suffer and die. So suffering is going to come anyways. But in the meantime, if you can minimize the suffering during your life by trying to mm, open your eyes 
open your eyes, educate yourself uh, before you have an opinion to make sure that you're informed as much as you can be. That's living in the present and getting all the information that you can before you take action, but also taking action, taking action when that's necessary. You don't want to see that something has to happen and, and, and decide that it's not necessary. There's something that's written in the Proverbs about um, having something that your neighbor wants and you have it there. It's wrong to deny him of that and to give it to him later. If you have it now, you give it now. So it's better to be true, even though it's, you know, And but all, all I've had to do is you ask for courage and strength. You pray, you ask for courage and strength and you do the next right thing, whether it's un, whether it's uncomfortable or not. And it makes it possible if you ask for courage and strength before you do it. Because obviously we, if we were so uh, well put together that we didn't need God's love and God's graces to help us, uh, we wouldn't have all these prayers, but we're not, we're just not, uh, we're suffering individuals. We we're broken and we need to pray for what we need, whether it's courage or strength or compassion or kindness, whatever it is that we need. We have to ask for those things and then uh, it'll be given if we're truly asking, if we're truly asking. Um, why do you think there's redemption? Well, because I think that mm, God is good and he it wants us to uh, prosper and to flourish and, and he's looking for ab abundance. And so although there are trials that we have to go through, if we can humble ourselves because through humility, if we can learn, then there's redemption. And redemption is just a, a matter of taking the blinders from your eyes and seeing what's there and admitting admitting what's there and not pretending that it that the world is otherwise to suit your um fantasy you know i've i've been thinking of the uh the uh, climate change people and their insistence that the climate needs their uh needs their life to be devoted to it yet there is no uh that they're, they're not pro life at the same time so although they want to save the environment they want to um get rid of all the cows in Ireland like 200 i think it was 200,000 cows they were wanting to get rid of to uh you know, to sacrifice to the to the climate change. And are they sacrificing babies now to the climate change too? Is that the idea? Is that why they believe in abortion? But they want climate change. So, you know, there's a there's a lot of trouble in the um there's a lot of trouble in in people thinking that they have uh, a philosophy that is going to bring a, a utopia that isn't what is God's will. Because you, if you put something like the climate on top of God's will, then uh, things, then it's not, it's not, it's going to skew reality because God has to be on the top. God always has to be. You have to have what is best in mind when you're searching for what is the next right thing to do. And if you're searching for something like climate change and putting that on top, well, then you're going to skew what is best because you're looking to twist everything to go and adhere to your uh, idea that this thing that you are praying to, which is the environment, is the answer. And you can tell because there's a, there's a disconnect between, you know, like what, what's this about abortion? If there's a, so you're killing babies to save the environment. Those two things 
or you're killing cows and babies to save the environment. And you're uh, taking the energy away from poor people so that you can save the environment. So there's a lot of misery and death that you're starting to um, want to put forward for your utopia. And you're seeing a disconnect. There's a lot, there's a way more suffering. And if there's too much suffering, you got to know that what you're going for you, you got to reevaluate that. That's when you have to take the blinders off and see what you're doing. Um, why is a practice valuable? Mm, well, you know, we don't need, when I was a little kid, I was 13. My aunt uh, introduced me to doing yoga. She sent me home with a book and I did it every day after that. And I thought, you know, This doesn't seem like it's doing anything for me now, but I think it will when I'm older. Uh, so I had an I had an insight that practice of this, whatever I was doing, was, although in the present, seemed trivial, it might be in the future something that I needed. And so you're supposed to practice prayer you know that's that's what that's what they say you practice prayer why do you practice prayer why do you why do you go to church on sundays it's another practice you go to church on sundays why would you do that um i used to go to church and i would sometimes think well i don't like what the the sermon today and i don't think that it was uh, I don't think that the minister is inspired, and so, or I, I didn't like the the choir and what they were singing. I don't, I don't think that was done very well. Or maybe I don't even like the people that are in the church, the congregation, the poor suffering people. Maybe I don't like them either. But it, it, it's not about what you like or what you want when you go to church. It's a practice that you've gone into God's house and you're saying, and you're getting on your knees and you're saying, "I'm here." That's all you're doing. It's a practice because one day you're going to be in a situation where you've lost everything and chaos is all around you and you're going to walk into the church and then you're going to want help. And if you've practiced by, by going there every Sunday, then this Sunday when you go, help will be there. And it's the same with prayer. If you pray every day and it's a good idea. I pray every morning and probably just about every morning, I would say there's something in the day. That's a challenge that I can make peace with during my prayer time. So that when I start my day, I have my head clear and that way I can see what's going on and then be ready for whatever comes my way. And it's, it's the practice. It isn't, oh my goodness, I'm in trouble. I'm going to pray today. That's not how it works. It's, oh my goodness, I'm in trouble today. I'm going to look to this grand tradition that I have, that I have taken part in as much as I could. And, and there is where I'm going to find help and redemption. Um. You've kind of talked about this, but why is the truth so important? Well, then you forget. If you don't tell the truth, you forget who you are. You know, it's hard It's hard enough to keep your head straight without trying to, you know, trying to make an, another story about who you are. Because then other people think you're this other person that you've said you are. Well, if enough people around you think that's who you are, that's probably who you are. And you aren't that you aren't yourself anymore. And so you lose, you'll lose yourself. And the thing is, who do you think you are losing yourself? Because we think that we're in charge of our own lives. I always thought that I had mm, a say in who I was and what I did and what happened to me as well. And that's not true. That's self-will. If you're living with God's will, then you have to realize that um, that you aren't in control. And so 
who you are is uh, it's not up it's not up to us we can do our best you know we can uh take care of ourselves cuz you know i mean we have jobs to do we have we have responsibilities we have responsibilities to do the next right thing and that means uh tidying your room taking care of yourself making sure that you're healthy and making sure that you've taken care of the people around you and done whatever you can for your community. that That's the next right thing. And if you do those things, then um, then when something happens, you have a community to, to, uh, to depend on or to reach out to. And they And if you've been telling the truth, they'll help by telling you the truth. If you've been lying to everybody and then you... Uh, you try to come clean, that's going to be a shock to the people that you've been pulling, you've been pulling their leg for a long time. You know, then you've got to overcome all of that before you can have any communication. So it complicates your life. It's not, it's not a good plan. It's just not a good plan. Um, Why was the grief that you saw in your son's eyes so life-changing? Well, I think if you have a baby, do you have any kids? I have a 11 year old daughter. Yeah. Well, you know, then when you meet your baby at the beginning, especially as a mother, I don't know what it's like for a father exactly, but for a mother, you know, you've had this baby inside you and then you have this baby to see and the bond is uh, a bond that you've never had with anyone else. And I have two kids and my bond with both my kids is like that. And that's the thing too, is the love is endless. So you have just as much love for one child as you do for the next child. So it, and this, my son was my second child and, um, you know, our relationship was good really from the time he was little. We, uh, he was a tough little kid. Um, he had his own mind about things. And when he was doing things, that we didn't want him to do, we had to have an argument. And so he has sat on the stairs quite a bit when he was two, um, getting his, getting, getting himself together, I guess, getting himself together and having a good day is what we used to say. If he wanted to have a good day, he had to get himself together. And he really did get himself together so that when Michaela was sick, when she was a teenager, he was a little younger than her. He was probably in grade nine, I think, when she was in nine or 10, when she was had her hip and ankle done. And um, he was just there all the time. He wasn't, he didn't, he had, wasn't disappeared with his friends. I mean, he went out and played hockey and, you know, he had, he, he was, uh, I think in, he was in music. And so he would go out and uh, play music with his friends. It wasn't that he, but he often brought his friends home. And so we never had to uh dis we never had to discipline him after he was two, really, to tell you the truth. We disciplined him good when he was two. And then he was he was a pretty good kid. And and we could talk to each other. We had our moments, you know. I remember one time we sent the kids out to see their grandparents, and he wasn't very old. He was probably seven, uh, or maybe eight. And uh I think they were out there for a week before we got there. And uh, I think that, I don't know what happened while we were gone, but when we got there, he was mad at us for leaving us there. And so he was pouting, he was pouting. And we had to have a, we had to have a heart to heart talk with him. And he had to have a cry. And, you know, we had to say we were sorry for leaving him too long, if we left him too long with his grandparents. But we could do that with him. Like we could always work through things. And so I think that when I looked at him, our relationship, he he had trusted our relationship, you know. And so when I told him that I that I was supposed to die in 10 months, it was a real loss for him. It was he was losing his mother. And I loved my kids. So in terms of him having a mother, he had a very good relationship with his mom. And he loved me more than I loved myself. I didn't have the same relationship with myself that he had with me. 
And that's something that you can do with your children. You know, if if you haven't had a great childhood, if you haven't had a mother who was uh, nurturing, and so you're not, you weren't very nurtured yourself, if you nurture your kids, then you can have that relationship with someone again. And when I looked at him and he looked at me, I realized that it was, that I was worthwhile saving because he needed me. And so if I could live to be of service to him, that would be worthwhile. And uh, that was a, that was a, that was a, uh, an enlightened moment for me to realize that I was really worthy in a way that should save my life whenever I, when, when the doctors told me I was going to die, that it wasn't up to them. I realized that it wasn't up to them. You know, it was, it was a very strange moment. It must've been like this love that I have for my son and that he has for me must've been um, heavenly because it, it seemed to create a, a, a heavenly moment between us. Yeah. Remarkable, really. Um, what has your heart been like these days? What has my heart been like these days? Yeah. Mm. You know, I've had, I lost my dad. My dad died on December 11th, and now my sister's going to die in the next few months. Yet, I, and so I have my times of grief, and uh, I have my times of, of uh, discontent, but all I have to do is pray. I pray, and I pray about, what do I pray about? About being, um, about having a peer relationship with God. I pray about um, being persistent. So even though maybe things aren't working out well today, that I won't give up, that I'll persist and believe. Uh, and so then that is always helpful. So I, I don't seem to, I don't seem to fall deeply into anything anymore because I have this practice of prayer in the morning. It keeps me pretty, it, it catches me like a basket catches bread, you know, it, it uh, supports me. And so no matter what's happening, having my dad die and having my sister uh, suffer so terribly, um, I can, I can deal with it uh, with God's help. I can deal with it. I seem to be able to deal with whatever comes my way. Yep. Um, how do you feel when you're holding your great grandmother's rosary? Mm. Um, it's quite small, so it fits in my hand very well. And uh, I like it. I like it because it's it's black. It's got black stones on it or black pieces of wood. I think it is actually black pieces of wood. And I don't know. I feel a, I feel that I have a relationship with it. I feel that I have a relationship with it. And that it, it's, I like to keep my rosary in my purse so that, it, so that it's, I know where it is. You know, I'm, I'm organized enough. I know where my rosary is. And I, it's it's a it's a tactile reminder. It's a tactile reminder to um, to turn my attention to God. And I don't just have my grandmother's rosary. I have other rosaries that people have given me, and I can make that relationship with all those rosaries. I have rosaries that are big with big beads, great big beads. And I have a little rosary that's just 10, 10 um, metal beads, 10 metal beads with a cross in the middle. So it's like one decade of beads. I have all kinds of beads, uh, all kinds of rosaries. And they all signify my adherence to God's will. So they are 
a reminder to me. That's what they are. They're a reminder to pray. They're a reminder to be persistent. They're a reminder for me to detach from worldly things. They're a rem reminder to be humble. I mean, there's many reminders that are associated with the intentions of in the rosary. And they're all good reminders. Um, this is a bit of a weird question too, but I'm curious what you what you think about um, the question. What is uh, grace? Well, when we are in discomfort, say we've done something we shouldn't have done, then we're in hell pretty much when we've done something we shouldn't have done. So we've got ourselves in a predicament. Uh, if we are, if we can see our mistakes, if we can see our mistakes, then God grants us relief from our discomfort. And I would say that's God's grace is to realize that we can forgive, forgive ourselves. We can forgive other people. That's God's grace if we can do that. And what would you say peace is? Peace is uh, spending my time without, uh, without any, without anything, without any, without being attached to anything. I'm peaceful if I have a relationship with the world that is balanced, you know, that's, that's peace. If, if I'm needing from the world or I feel the world is needing from me, that, that creates some imbalance. So if I feel like a, everything, you know, that I, if I've said yes, that I want to do something, I have to be true to myself that, yes was the right word if no is the right word then i have to be true to myself that no is the right word and then to leave it there and that not being attached gives you peace um last thing i wanted to ask you about um why catholicism good question why why catholicism i thought maybe orthodoxy you know and a bit um and then i thought well really which one do i choose and i would say that catholicism was more accessible so it was the path of least resistance when i was looking to belong that seemed to be the uh, most straightforward way to go and so that's the way i went and then you know, as as I went in that direction, I I also found you know that I have this history of Catholicism in my family, and so it made sense in a way. And my friend Queenie, who came to the hospital and gave me a rosary, she was Catholic, and so there were signs that were coming in my direction that um, that Catholicism was the direction I should go. And it's got a it's got a good history. It's got a deep history. And so I want to belong to a faith that has a deep history and is mm, is true to the scriptures and and Catholicism seem to fit that. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today. My really pleasure. appreciate it. Um, it was great to speak with you. Are you, where are you in Saskatchewan? Uh, I'm in Regina. You're in Regina. Yeah. My brother was in Regina. Okay. That's yeah. cool. That's cool. Is it cold there? Um, it hasn't been that bad this winter, actually. No. It's been kind of but, mild. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we were in Chicago and we went on a river cruise yesterday. There's supposed okay. to be a ice right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I heard there's an El Nino this year. So we're benefiting from a little bit of warmth. So that's nice. That's okay with me. That's okay with me, too. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.